Welcome everyone to the Friday research seminar and also the Campbell lecture in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences um, at Oregon State University. We're so happy to have you here today um, to join us for this presentation via Zoom. We have muted all of your microphones and but we would love to have questions from the audience. So please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. We'll be moderating and repeating questions for our guests today. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Craig Newshafe, who is the Dean of the College of Health and Human Development at Penn State University, and also a professor of biobehavioral health. Before coming to Penn State, he was professor of public health and associate dean for research at the Drexel University Dornsife School of Public Health. At Drexel, he was the founding director of the AJ Drexel Autism Institute, the first autism research center focused on public health science. He earned his PhD in chronic disease epidemiology at John Hopkins University and his MS at Harvard University School of Public Health. It's our great pleasure to introduce him today. He's going to be presenting on a public health science approach to autism. And this is an annual lecture that is sponsored by Cynthia and Duncan Campbell. It's our lecture series that we have every year. And it's also sponsored by the Halley Ford Center for Healthy Children and Families and our College of Public Health and Human Development. So welcome so much, Dean Newshafer. I'm lovely to have you. I wish you could be here in person, but I'm really looking forward to hearing your talk today. Uh, thank you very much, Megan. And thanks everybody for taking some time this afternoon. Um, I too am uh, I'm sorry that I'm not with you in, in Corvallis. It would be uh, wonderful to get a chance to uh, to visit your beautiful campus, and hopefully I'll be able to do that sometime in the in, in the future. So, uh, title of my talk is a public health science approach to autism. Um, just show you quickly at the top some acknowledgments. Get that out of the way. I'm, I'm very fortunate to be part of a number of uh, of different uh, uh, scientific teams working in this research space. Of, of particular note are my colleagues uh, back at the uh, AJ Drexel Autism Institute that was mentioned in the introduction, and also. Um, colleagues I've uh, maintained at the Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health and the Lindy Clagg Center there. Uh, a lot of the work I do is in collaboration with, uh, with those folks and continues to be so. Uh, listed some of the funders of our work over the years and uh, no real, uh, no, no, no conflicts with uh, anything I'm going to uh, present to you all this afternoon. All right, so um, Here's, uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to um, uh, talk first about uh, uh, whether or not autism is a significant public health challenge. Um, and then I will uh, transition and uh, um, discuss for a little bit taking a public health science approach to the, uh, uh, to the challenges posed by autism spectrum disorders. And also um, uh, address a little the question of whether or not what we've been doing in autism research is, is, is or isn't following a public health science approach. Uh, then I'll um, talk about issues and advances in the areas of tertiary, secondary, and primary prevention. So I've, I've, I've uh, on this slide, given a little preview to sort of the framework I'll use to be talking about a public health science approach to autism, um, going with this uh, uh, three-level prevention framework. And um, I'll close with just a quick word on public health science, autism, and COVID-19. It's really impossible uh, to talk about anything from a public health perspective these days without uh, mentioning the pandemic. So I'll uh, comment on that briefly and I'll just recap and, and uh, be delighted to take some questions. All right, so is autism a significant public health challenge? Well, I obviously believe the answer is, is yes. Um, Let's think about the public health burden posed by autism spectrum disorders. Um, what I have here are data from uh, the Centers for Disease Control's uh, Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network. These are the best prevalence estimates for autism in the United States. Um, and what you can see from the latest surveillance year, which is 2016, data that just came out uh, this past spring, that the, the, the estimated prevalence for autism spectrum disorders is, is a little under 2%, two, 2%, one in 54. So that makes autism the most common serious neurodevelopmental disorder uh, in the United States. This surveillance system relies on uh, uh, 
taking a look at about about 10% of the US populations of eight year olds. And it, it's a records based surveillance system. So it relies on information gathered from a variety of existing sources. So it is not immune uh, to diagnostic and diagnostic tendency biases. So even though you see a very steep uh, increase in this prevalence estimate, it's likely that uh, part of that is attributable to changes in diagnostic tendency. For example, um, 60% of the identified cases in, in 2016 had uh, IQs below 85. Uh, in the first year, the 2002 year, 68%, um, almost 70% of the identified cases had IQs below 85. So, I mean, that could be a real ideological change that there's increased incidence in the less cognitively impaired individuals, but it's more likely that we've expanded our, our recognition of autism in individuals who are more cognitively able. So um, rising prevalence over a short period of time sends a sing signal about environmental factors, but in the case of autism, it's complicated because we know that, that, that these estimates are, are, are uh, substantially influenced by changing diagnostic and recognition uh, tendency. But nonetheless, it is the most common serious neurodevelopmental disorder in the United States. Uh, there also are substantial costs associated with autism in, in the US. Um, this study is a few years old, but it estimated that the annual cost of autism is around $250 billion. The annual cost for uh, diabetes estimated by the American Diabetes Association is 245 billion. So the cost of autism are on parallel with diabetes, which is a major uh, um, public health challenge in, in and of itself. Um, this estimate includes medical costs, non-medical costs, social services, residential support, and also opportunity costs, lost, lost income. Um, if you look at this, you see a couple of things in this graphic. Uh, first, you, you'll notice that functional status influences cost and the, the lifetime cost for individuals who have, an, who have autism with an intellectual disability, that's with ID, are uh, um, almost double those of individuals who, who are not cognitively impaired. And, and you'll also see that the bulk of the annual cost of autism, even though we think of it as a childhood condition, are actually in adults. Uh, with, with with autism, uh, they're accruing um, lost uh, lost costs of income, and uh, also have, are, are dealing with medical comorbidities that that tend to move with autism in uh, adulthood. So, so, highly prevalent, significant uh, costs associated with autism. So, um, from the research perspective. Uh, or ha how have we been increasing the attention in the research field that we've been paying to, to autism? And research funding has been proxy for such attention. And so while the prevalence has been going up, so too has the research funding uh, associated with autism. So th this, this comes from a report that I'll talk about a little bit in a couple of slides. And you'll see that um, uh, th there is a pronounced increase. We see the, the, the blips in funding associated with the, the era era uh, from days gone by. But um, the, the 2016 uh, um, funding total is about 65% greater than it was in 2008, which is, which is, which is fantastic. So we have been putting more um, uh, funding, uh, more effort and funding into research on autism spectrum disorders over time. This next slide, however, compares autism funding to funding for Alzheimer's disease. And one always hates to, to, to pit one condition against another for resources. Uh, Alzheimer's is certainly a critically important public health challenge in and of itself and, and deserving of much resources. But, but, but this, this, this comparison is uh, in, in, informative. Um, the prevalence of Alzheimer's is about the same as autism, it's about 2%. And as you know, Alzheimer's affects uh, predominantly an elderly population. 80% of the cases of Alzheimer's disease in the US are, are above uh, age 75. Um, the funding for, uh, for Alzheimer's, the research funding for Alzheimer's is about eight times greater than that for, for autism. Cost, cost estimates for, uh, for Alzheimer's put the annual cost of around 300 billion, so a little bit more than, 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 uh, than are associated with autism. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, 
similar burden, similar prevalences, and a great disparity in uh, in, re in research investment. You know, why is that? It's 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 really hard to say. I mean, I think that um, individuals uh, who make decisions about allocating these resources tend to be a little bit older themselves, and and perhaps are living in the immediate with the challenges of of uh, cognitive decline among uh, parents and family members, and, and, and while policymakers also have personal experience with autism, you know, by the time they're uh, of an age where they have some influence, they've probably reconciled themselves, have their, have, have their, their kids uh, um, set in, in, in care situations, and maybe it's not a friend of mine. So it's, it's, it's hard to know, but this disparity is striking, and I think it, it, it underscores the fact that uh, uh, we need more investment in autism research. And uh, what I would like to see is I would like to see that that investment take a uh, public health science approach. So when I when I talk about a public health science approach, what am I what am I talking about? And I think uh, um, this is uh, I'm speaking to a school of public health, so I know that you're all quite familiar with various definitions of public health. This is a version um, that comes from ASPH. Uh, um, we know that when we think about public health approaches, we're emphasizing population approaches emphasizing prevention, and we're uh, also emphasizing the promotion of health and, and well-being in addition to the prevention of, of, of chronic disease. And uh, as I uh, previewed before, uh, what um, I want to try to do is use the three-level prevention paradigm to, to talk us through some of the uh, challenges and opportunities with respect to autism science. So we'll talk about primary pre prevention, which uh, focuses on um, identifying modifiable causes and, and reducing exposure or eliminating exposure to those. Talk about secondary prevention, which is uh, the identification of, of symptoms early and then uh, uh, implementing effective uh, intervention as soon as possible. And then we'll talk about tertiary prevention, minimizing disability and promoting quality of life throughout the uh, entire lifespan. Uh, first, though, let's take a second, uh, uh, again, to, to, to think about whether or not what we've been doing with respect to autism research has been uh, um, uh, congruent with the sort of public health science approach. So we have the luxury in autism research of having um, these reports done by something called the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee. That committee was convened um, back in 2000 when a, a major child health funding act was passed. And uh, they sort of monitor and set federal research priorities across the different agencies. So not just NIH and HHS, but also DOE, uh, HRSA, et cetera. And, 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 and they monitor funding trends. So um, the, the data I'm gonna show come from, uh, come from uh, this, this uh, report. And uh, they include all funders. Uh, so uh, about 65% of autism research funding comes from NIH, but um, uh, there's also major private funders. The Simons Foundation funds about 25, 20% of autism research. Uh, DOE, a fairly small share, only 5%, even though know, special education is a critically important service provider for, for kids with autism and, and then the other agencies. But th so they're all included here. And the, the, the typology that they use to sort of categorize research funding is, is what you see here screening and diagnosis, which I think certainly relates to primary prevention, then uh, uh, basic biology risk factors, which can relate to primary prevention, but note that there's both genetic and non-genetic risk factors, and genetic risk factors uh, are uh, potentially less amenable to, to primary prevention strategies. Treatment interventions, uh, services, lifespan issues, which would relate to tertiary prevention, promoting quality of life, and infrastructure, and uh, surveillance. So if we take a look for uh, 2016, this is the latest year we have these data available at the distribution of of, uh, of research funding, we see that 35% went towards basic biology, 25% towards risk factors, and I would say about two thirds of that risk factor investment was on the genetic side of things. So right there, almost half of the research pie doesn't have anything to do or has less to do with uh, a public health science uh, perspective. And if we look for some of the categories that are directly related to public health, like if you look up there, if you have peak, that peak slice um, uh, lifespan issues uh, only took about 2% of the research pie. So, so um, clearly not enough research funding going towards life course and lifespan issues in, in autism. And actually over time, the shift has been, has actually been towards biology. Uh, in 2008, biology comprised only uh, about 18% of the, of the research funding. 
So all of the categories have actually been reduced as the focus on biology has expanded. So it's a fair question to ask, are we, are, is our momentum taking us in the right, the right direction with regard to a, a public health science approach to autism? So, so let's talk a little bit more, uh, a little more depth about, about that approach. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, um, uh, I'm going to start with tertiary prevention and I'm going to move uh, to secondary prevention and then I'll end talking about uh, primary prevention. Uh, so um, what, what I want to note off the top is you're not, as probably isn't surprising given, given that, that peak at the, at the funding, the fact that so little resources have, have, have gone in this area, there are a number of major re uh, research gaps here. And um, I'll point out a few that I'm going to speak a little bit more about with some examples of, of some work that uh, I've been involved in. But uh, one, one, one gap has to do with assistive technologies, uh, particularly with regard to a manner of alternative communication. There's this perception that we've kind of hit the ceiling and there hasn't been much innovation in that space. And there's really tremendous room, as, as I think you'll see, to do some exciting work in that area. There's also been a lack of focus on the adulthood period, studying uh, uh, just quantifying outcomes for adults with autism, and, and also, of course, understanding the determinants and the emerging adulthood period, particularly key when, when individuals separate from the special education ser service system where they've been receiving most of their services throughout childhood into a very fragmented and, and patchwork uh, service environment. And then there's been lack of uh, attention to thinking about community network and system level determinants for the outcomes over, over the life course, extending through this emerging adulthood period and, and into, into adulthood. So let me, let me um, give a few examples of how um, work that I've been involved in is trying to, to plug some of these, these gaps in, in the area of tertiary prevention. So first, uh, thinking a little bit about this, the ceiling in, in, in uh, AAC and uh, alternative and augmented communication. So a lot of the AAC technologies that you'll see um, uh, use these non-intuitive grid-like layouts. Um, they, they use symbols um, that were often crafted with in ways that weren't informed by uh, research and the representations can be or for concepts and require a lot of uh, cognitive processing to, 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 work, to work them through. You know, basically they, these, these, these technologies look like they were designed by folks who were very well intentioned, but really didn't have a lot of uh, um, theoretical training or research base or, or around communication sciences and building these things. So for example, I've, I've, I've picked on the, um, the pictograph for the, for, the, for, the, for the word want and in a, in a general sample of children who were just shown this, they were asked to sort of identify the concept. Only 4% of them intuitively labeled that as, as want. They had a lot of other creative answers for what that, that, that might mean. So um, the, the, these systems really can use a substantial reimagining. And, and there are some very interesting ways to approach this. And, and, and one, of those, um, one of those is to use uh, 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 videos and visual scene display AAC approaches, and, and we have a, uh, uh, a center at, at, at Penn State that's run by uh, Janice Light, a professor in the Communication Science and Disorders uh, Department and an international expert in AAC. Uh, this is a, a Nidler-funded a Nidler um, research center that has developed some video-based uh, AAC uh, uh, approaches that use these visual scene displays. These scenes can be, can be built by the user. They can record their own videos. They can, um, they can identify hotspots and scenes that convey messages that they would like to communicate. And they can program in the, um, the, um, uh, the communication that goes with the hotspot. And they can organize these scenes on their display and readily find them and, um, and, and, access, um, and access these videos. So there, there are a number of advantages uh, to this kind of approach over the static pictograph approach that's sort of the traditional way of, of doing things. And um, Janice's center is uh, going to be uh, in their current round of funding, which just started this year, they're going to be on a large scale randomized controlled trial of, of their VSD approach in uh, adolescents with the autism to try to see if it, if it uh, improves uh, not only functional communication, but also community integration. 
Uh, so, so a very exciting study and, and just a hint at, at what can be done in, in this uh, research space. So, so the, 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 uh, the second gap I talked about was a lack of data on outcomes in adults. And uh, I want to highlight some work done by Paul Shattuck, who's a former colleague of mine at the uh, Asia Drexel Autism Institute. Uh, Paul did a great job of, of um, really elevating the consciousness of, of, of some, some, some basic uh, uh, adverse outcomes in, in adults with autism. He produced a series of national autism indicator reports um, that were that were built really for for the eyes of, 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 of policymakers, and uh, this 2015 edition focuses on that transition age, transition to adulthood. And Paul leveraged data from the National Longitudinal Transition Study, that's a, 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 a U.S. Department of Education survey that uh, um, represented sampling from 500 school districts, almost 12,000 students in, in, in the sample. Uh, all uh, users of special education services, you can stratify by different special education exceptionalities and uh, follows them forward through, through school, through separation from special ed. And what Paul was able to report is it's very striking, this, these two very striking statistics that have gained a lot of currency that four in 10 young adults with autism, once they separate from the uh, special education system are completely disconnected from both work and continued education opportunities. They're not doing anything. And, and of those four disconnected young adults, one in four of those had had no access to any intervention services since they separated from the special education uh, system. So this, this is the profound service cliff that faces uh, young adults uh, with autism and is still uh, a very much a major, uh, major challenge today. Uh, another, another statistic from that 2015 uh, report over on the left side of the screen contrasts this disconnectedness by special education exceptionality. Um, and, and, and it underscores the fact that, that the young adults with autism actually had the highest proportion of disconnectedness, higher than any other special education uh, ex exceptionality. Um, on the right is uh, some data from uh, a, a newer analysis that Paul Street did, published in uh, uh, Journal of Autism and Development for Disabilities just this year. Um, I'm actually, I'm, I'm a little worried about my time, so I'm not going to talk through the results there, but, but these data were, were utilizing administrative data from the vocational rehabilitation system. And basically what, what, what Paul, Paul and colleagues found in this, in this study was that initiation of the vocational rehabilitation services simultaneously with special education services leads to dramatically better uh, employment outcomes. So uh, we're starting to move the needle on using data to, to understand the, the outcome scenario for young adults with autism and also trying to use it to, to underscore um, uh, some, some directions for uh, um, policy interventions and service interventions. So I want to I want to uh, transition now and talk a little bit about about secondary prevention, uh, early identification and, and, and early in intervention. And I think that this is probably the the the, 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 the one area in this um, public health research typology where the most work has been done over over the last three decades. It's been a lot of lot of uh, effort devoted on, on developing. Uh, early identification approaches, many of them based on parent self-report, some based on direct observation, and also there's been a lot of attention to developing um, evidence-supported intervention approaches for, for, for young children with, with autism. But there is still um, uh, much room for improvement. Harkening back to that, that um, CDC surveillance data that I showed you a few slides ago, uh, the, the sample of autism cases identified in 2016, the most recent data, those are eight-year-olds, they were born in 2008. Their median age at diagnosis, so the, the, the median age when they received their autism diagnosis was 51 months of age. Um, and, and that has barely moved since um, uh, 2010 when the, when the median age of diagnosis was 53. So there's no momentum in lowering that, that, that average age of diagnosis, at least over that time period. And we know that expert clinicians can diagnose autism uh, um, as young as uh, 24 months, 18 months in some cases. So we have a lot of room to go in terms of moving the average age of recognition in the, in, in the population and getting kids who are diagnosed early into uh, services. Another recent development 
was uh, um, the publication of uh, a, a United States Preventive Services Task Force recommendation on autism screening. So the, the task force looked at primary care-based autism-specific screening and didn't, didn't evidence review as they do for screening technologies uh, for chronic diseases, uh, for hypercholesterolemia, for diabetes. So they weighed in on autism screening and, and concluded much of the chagrin of a lot of the, the autism research and, and service community uh, that the evidence was insufficient at this point. Now, they found that the evidence was adequate that screening can detect autism early. They didn't see any harm to screening, but they found inadequate evidence of benefit, in particular um, because the treatment evaluation studies that had been done hadn't been done on screen detected cases. They were done more selected samples. So they were concerned about whether or not um, that, that benefit that we see from early intervention would, would, would carry out at the population and community level for, uh, were screening to be done at a large scale. And they pointed out that there hadn't been any large randomized uh, screening trials, which is a difficult, uh, difficult type of study to do, but it has begun. And uh, Diana Robbins, who is, uh, was another colleague of mine back at the Autism Institute and now is the, uh, the director of the, of the Autism Institute and expert in autism early detection, has a large scale randomized trial of, autism, of primary care practice autism based screening uh, un underway, uh, funded by NIH and one of these autism centers of excellence grants. Uh, what she's going to be doing is she's, she's working with 40 pediatric practices in the Philadelphia, Atlanta, and uh, uh, New Haven, Connecticut areas. And they're going to be enrolling about 3,500 children. Uh, they'll, they'll be randomized by practice about 50-50. About the experimental arm will uh, be systematically screened using the modified checklist for autism and, and toddlers, which is a, a, a parent uh, report uh, screening tool that performs uh, um, quite well. Uh, they'll receive that beginning at 18 months of age. And then any, any child, and, and, and the comparison arm won't have systematic screening. They'll do the kind of developmental surveillance that pedi pediatricians typically, typically do. Um, any child that's identified as being at risk of autism, whether in the experimental arm or the control arm, will, will get a diagnostic assessment at, at, at an academic uh, uh, center. And any child with a confirmed diagnosis will be moved into a high quality treatment, which is 20 hours a week of one-on-one of -on -one intervention uh, using the early start Denver model that I'll talk about in a minute accompanied by one-on-one -on -one parent coaching. So they'll get a very uh, Cadillac version of, of intervention. And the idea is to see whether or not um, the outcomes in the, in the screening arm where the screen was administered and ostensibly autism was detected earlier and, and, and intervention was started earlier, whether or not the downstream functional outcomes are, are, are better in that group than, than in, in the group of kids who were detected through the, through the usual developmental surveillance. Um, uh, Diana's got about two thirds of, of the sample enrolled and the kids are being followed. So I'm pace for results from this trial in uh, a, a couple of uh, years. So uh, another piece of work that I wanted to highlight uh, relates to the challenge of adapting evidence supported interventions for large scale community delivery. You just heard me talk about 20 hours a week of one-on-one -on -one therapy with parent coaching as the intervention being used in the, in the screening trial. And as you might intuit, that is a very resource intensive and expensive intervention. So a lot of work in, in, in secondary prevention is also focused on trying to see how we can modify our evidence supported interventions so they can be distributed uh, at, at, at scale. And uh, Giacomo Vivanti, um, pictured here is, is working on adapting that early start Denver model to be able to be delivered in, in, in uh, community-based preschool settings using a train-to-trainer approach. So basically we have experts train a teacher in the preschool and then the teacher trains the support staff in the preschool and they follow the principles of the early start Den Denver model, which, which really is a manualized uh, multidisciplinary behavioral developmental relationship-based intervention approach. So they'll, they'll follow that and they'll try to embed the manualized procedures into the, um, uh, uh, the naturalistic activities of the preschool day. 
So, so, so this has been um, something that's been developed, and, and, and this particular study is looking at its effectiveness in preschools in a sample in Israel, and they had very positive results uh, showing that um, children in, in the ESDN arm, this was a study that involved eight preschools, a fairly small study in central Israel, the, the, the kids who were in the preschool classrooms that were randomized to ESDM had, had, had significantly better outcomes. This particular graphic is, is uh, uh, a socialization measure from uh, the Vine, which is a, a standard behavioral assessment tool used in, in, uh, in, in child development research. So very promising. Um, and uh, Giacomo is trying to replicate this now in uh, a sample of uh, preschools in Philadelphia in, in underserved communities. So we've got to prove that the early intervention approaches work uh, work work well and that when you uh, embed uh, treatment, you get the kind of results that you would expect. And we have to also um, uh, find ways to, to make that treatment deliverable at scale in, in our communities. Um, another thing that we're trying to innovate on is trying to move forward uh, um, uh, uh, new approaches that can for, for, for the screening piece that might actually help scale those up. And uh, real quickly, this is a little validation study that Giacomo is also working on that's looking at um, uh, um, the possibility of capturing videos of young infants on cell phones. So parents take videos of their infants as they're watching a stimulus on a cell phone and use uh, computer vision analysis to actually uh, um, watch their gaze and looking at the stimulus and also um, make a depiction of their face, which looks in this looks very, very elementary, but this depiction of their face can actually capture a lot about uh, intentionality and expression. So what Giacomo is doing is he's in a, in a fairly small sample, he's, co he's comparing this uh, iPhone-based uh, CBA analysis to a gold standard um, eye tracking setup. Same kids will get the cell phone based tool and then they'll see similar stimuli in the gold standard eye tracking setup. And um, he'll compare uh, the, 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 the measures on habituation and joint attention and orienting the name, the name on the two platforms and hopefully confirm the, the validity of using this uh, very disseminatable um, iPhone based approach. And, and not only is this approach um, uh, uh, have potential for wide dissemination. It can also capture some other things that 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 something like eye tracking can't. It can capture facial expression. It can capture postural sway among infants, and it can capture vocalizations. And 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 and, and those things might might add some additional uh, predictive power to 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 new modes of, of early detection of of, of autism risk. All right, so um, I'm doing okay on time. I will transition now to talk a little bit about primary prevention. So primary prevention and identification of modifiable risk factors is where I do most of my work. And, 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 and the notion here again is to sort of see if there are uh, environmental avoidable risk factors that can be identified and we can take steps to, to, to reduce those exposures and hopefully uh, prevent um, the adverse outcomes that are associated with autism in, in, in that way. So in, in, in thinking a little bit about, about uh, the etiology, the causes of autism, um, the, the last three decades have, uh, have, have prompted a lot of advances in terms of um, genetic risk factors for autism. It turns out that autism does have a significant genetic component there's been a lot of work done from, from twin studies to family studies to now molecular genetic investigations, and that is not at all in doubt. Um, what, what's happened a little bit recently, though, is that there's been sort of a, 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 a uh, what I think is a little bit too much attention placed on simple heritability studies. And, and some, of the, some of the recent heritability studies have come up with very high estimates. Uh, this JAMA paper from, from, from last year had an 80% heritability estimate for autism spectrum disorders. And I put next to it a, a, a news story on that study that basically says the majority of autism risk resides in the genes. And, 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 and there's this tendency to sort of think about genes versus environmental causes, genetic causes versus possibly modifiable causes. And that's, um, 
uh, uh, sort of spurred his thinking. And uh, I spent a lot of time trying to disavow folks of that uh, particular uh, view. If we have a, an ideologically complex condition like, like autism, there's very likely multi-factor of causation involved. I mean, we know for those of you who study epidemiology, we know that in these situations there are multiple component causes and each may be necessary, but insufficient. So if you remove one cause, the, the outcome is lost. In this case, the autism phenotype is, is lost. And this is, is implying interaction between causes. So if you, if you look at that little uh, um, box that represents four possible component causes, if we remove cause A, the condition disappears because you need all four of those component causes. Uh, each is necessary, but none is sufficient. So you could then say that, that, that this, this condition is 100% attributable to uh, cause A. But similarly, if we remove cause B, we also have no cases, right? Because each cause is necessary, but not sufficient. So the condition is also 100% attributable to cause B. And, and so under, under multifactorial causation, you know, something with a concept that's well known to epidemiologists, causal contributions exceed 100%. Yet heritability estimation, because it's a parsing of variance, is, is boxed in at thinking like we have one divisible pie, that, are, that things have to add up to 100%. And it's just, it's just uh, uh, not, not, not true. So um, in thinking about autism heritability, it's important. The genetic, the genetic contribution is important. These heritability estimates are, are high. They might not be as high as 80%. They kind of really range from 50 to 80%. Um, but but the, the methods that are used are, are, are very strongly assumption-based, and they don't consider this possibility of, of interaction of causes. So you know, I think we need to move from thinking about a genes versus environment kind of situation to a, a genes and environment situation. And, and there are other reasons to think that uh, environmental causes might be contributing to autism risk. There are some historical examples. Um, there was a very famous case series of uh, thalidomide exposed infants. So these were infants who were exposed back in the 1950s. And there was a retrospective review of, of their records. And there were 85 cases who were exposed and all had very se severe um, uh, congenital malformations, which is what thalidomide is known to cause. But four of those cases in the series of we've got 85 infants on the channel, four had autism. And, and the, the, the uh, timing of exposure to thalidomide was within a three-day window between the 20th and 24th day. Uh, so a very tight ideologic window um, that suggests this powerful teratogen uh, can also cause uh, um, uh, neurodevelopmental consequences in the form of an, of an autism uh, phenotype. Uh, in addition, um, more uh, modern work that's been done um, in, in uh, uh, developmental neuroscience uh, ha has also directed us to the prenatal exposure window, just as that thalidomide study did. Uh, in, in the interest of, of, of time, I'm not going to go through each of these, but these are different, different um, uh, neuroscience studies that suggest neuropathology that must start in the prenatal window. Some of it, some of it comes from neuroanatomy studies and, and some of it comes from uh, more recent brain gene expression studies. But the evidence really is accumulating in that direction that, that an, an initiating event likely happens in the prenatal uh, period. So when we think about genes in the environment interacting, we tend to try to uh, focus a little bit on the prenatal period. And there has been work going on over the last couple of decades um, uh, trying to identify uh, environmental risk factors. Uh, there are a number of comprehensive reviews that, um, that, that cover this literature uh, 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 fa fa fairly well. I've, I've listed on this slide uh, some places where the, the evidence has uh, accumulated. Um, I note that, that some of these um, exposures could also be operating through um, genetic mechanisms. Like if we, if we take just, for example, the, um, the findings on uh, prenatal exposure to antidepressants, there's been more than uh, 10 studies that have suggested elevated uh, risk with prenatal exposure to SSRIs. But, but what happens is when we look at trying to um, uh, parse out the confounding by indication to see, to see whether or not the, the um, the um, uh, uh, 
mental health problem that leads to the, to the antidepressant prescription, when we try to adjust to the influence of, of that problem in the parent and the potential genetic load that goes with that problem, the effect of the exposure is, is reduced. So it's unclear yet whether or not you know, that is a, a, a true independent exposure effect or whether it's due to the genetic loading associated with the, the indicating, indicating diagnosis. Uh, but there are um, some of these that are strictly environmental. The evidence is probably strongest for maternal infection in the prenatal period and, and fairly suggestive for a uh, short interpregnancy uh, interval. But we are still trying to uncover uh, new environmental risk factors for autism. And here is a, a, a recent example of a study uh, that I worked on with uh, um, my colleague Kristen Lyle uh, back, at, back at Drexel. Uh, this, this paper just came out in uh, AJE, in the Journal of Epidemiology, and it was looking at maternal prenatal exposure, exposure to, um, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to fatty acids. Um, and this was a case control study that took advantage of uh, the fact that in the state of California, uh, prenatal screening banks uh, a sample of serum. So when, when, when the moms come for prenatal uh, um, screening, a proportion of them have a serum sample drawn and banked for research purposes. So you can access serum from the prenatal period. And uh, what, what Kristen did was uh, she, she used the California uh, Development and Disability Service Agency to identify autism cases, birth certificate controls, and then pulled those serum sample, samples and uh, measured uh, uh, circulating fatty acid levels in, um, in, in, in the samples. So uh, 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 PUFAs uh, have been suggested to be neurodevelopmentally significant, uh, that where, where increased, increased exposure to, to, to PUFAs has been thought to be neuroprotective. Uh, they uh, play a role in neurogenesis and differentiation and establishing connectivity in the, in the developing brain. Um, and, and so there's particular interest in, in uh, certain classes of these, the omega-3s, and some of the essential fatty acids. So um, uh, Kristen was interested in seeing if, 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 if the circulating level of fatty acids in moms here in the pregnancy was correlated with, with autism risk. And um, in this particular study, we did not see uh, evidence of, of such an association, either in, in, in cases of autism that, that, that where there was cognitive impairment or, or cases where there was not cognitive impairment, there was a little suggestion of protection of increasing uh, uh, PUFA exposure in the group without, uh, with, without intellectual impairment. And she looked at all the different subclasses of PUFAs, including those essential fatty acids, and, and, and the, the, the results were, were fairly similar. So we're still looking. This was not, does not appear to be a hot lead for a potential uh, modifiable autism risk factor, but that work does continue. And I think for it to bear fruit, we're really going to have to, given what I said about um, the importance of, 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 uh, of genetics, we're going to have to think about um, we're going to, have to think about those exposures in the context of of, um, of genetic background. And and right now, um, very little work has been done. There's only been six empirical studies looking at gene and environment interaction for autism risk, and none of them have had replicated results. So we have to find ways to do better. And and for those of you who who are interested in gene environmental inter interaction know that this is challenging. It can be very um, difficult uh, to do candidate gene studies looking at one gene and one exposure at a time. There's a lot of, uh, um, a lot, a lot of challenges in terms of uh, possible cross positives in those kinds of designs. You need to have the genetic and the environmental data collected on the same sample. There's a lot of barriers to doing this kind of work. Um, so we're very interested in, in um, trying to do the, um, the methodologic work that will facilitate larger scale gene environment interaction studies in, in, in autism. And uh, I'm looking at my clock, so I'm not gonna spend a, a lot of time on, on this. Um, essentially, one of the things that we're very interested in doing is developing good polygenic risk scores. So we no longer have to look at one gene at a time. We can get a, um, a genetic risk score for autism that we, can then, that we can then use against multiple different exposures. So um, we're doing some developmental work in, 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 in the ECHO project uh, with my colleague Heather Volk trying to build an autism polygenic uh, risk score. At the same time, we're also interested in finding new sources of exposure information. 
in ways that we can assess multiple exposures simultaneously. And also in the ECHO project, we're, we're doing work on uh, looking at exposure measurement in shed deciduous teeth. They are a really exciting uh, biosample for evaluating prenatal exposure because uh, teeth, uh, uh, baby teeth begin to, to, to form uh, at the end of the first trimester. And um, as they're built, as layer upon layer of dentin is added, um, those layers can be can actually be sampled through microspatial, microspatial sampling. And we can look for um, measures of exposure in that tooth dentin using uh, different mask uh, spectroscopy techniques. And, and, and this approach has already been built out for exposure to metals. Um, uh, my colleague Nish Aurora at Mount Sinai is, is, is uh, at the vanguard of this work. And, and we are working with Manish's lab right now to try to validate these kinds of assays on different environmental exposures, a number of different persistent organic pollutants that are known to have more developmental effects. So from one shed deciduous teeth, we might be able to get um, time-ordered exposure on, on, on multiple environmental chemicals from about the beginning of the second trimester on. And um, this is also an exceedingly fun biosample to collect, unlike uh, drawing blood from a, from, a, from a small child here. I, I love to, to, to show this envelope. This is uh, came into one of our study sites in North Carolina, where um, one of our participants was sending in a, a shed tooth and, and, and uh, imploring that the, the tooth fairy not, uh, not, not take the tooth, but they leave it for, for us, the researchers. All right, so I've, 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 I've covered some, some, some issues and some advances related to both uh, um, tertiary prevention, secondary prevention, and, 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 and primary prevention. Uh, just a quick word before I open it up for questions on, uh, on public health science, autism, and, and, and uh, COVID-19. Uh, so um, I, th I think if you were to think for a minute about, about how uh, the global pandemic might be affecting um, families at risk for autism, children with autism, adults with autism, you would be um, alarmed. You might be worried that the infection itself might play an ideologic role. You might be worried that the social isolation um, would be uh, would, would, would create some challenges for young children who are receiving intensive early intervention services at, at in school settings that they're no longer attending. Um, you might be worried about delays in early recognition because kids aren't getting regular developmental checkups in the time of the pandemic. And all these things are of concern. And they did a quick, quick review of the literature on autism and COVID-19. And uh, there, there have probably been about 70-ish publications that have emerged uh, with the search terms and they distribute, as you see, there's been a lot of just general speculative reviews, but there have been some specific studies thinking about um, and investigating empirically uh, different aspects here, trying to see whether that outcomes are being affected. You can work in the services arena in, 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 in telehealth, which is not surprising because there's been a transition um, in autism services towards telehealth, as there's been in a lot of other areas. So there have been some studies that have been trying to um, evaluate the effectiveness of that, of that, of that pivot. And um, some speculate that that might have you know, car positive carryover effects if they figure out that we can deliver certain kinds of interventions and supports through telehealth that might help us uh, expand our, our, our reach of our services um, uh, in, in, in the post-pandemic period. So um, there's a lot of concern. Um, I note over on the side that there's, there's one paper's appeared that's really just tried to set up a autism and COVID research agenda. And I'm sure there's gonna be um, more work done in the, in, in, in the months and years to come um, on the impacts of the pandemic on this specific uh, population. So uh, to close, just briefly recap, recap before I open it up for questions. Um, I believe a public health approach provides a useful framework um, for thinking about doing impactful autism science. Um, if, 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 if we think about those three levels of prevention, we're just scratching the surface, surface when it comes to, to, to tertiary prevention and thinking about adult outcomes. If we think about uh, um, secondary prevention, um, uh, 
we're, we're, we're in the midst of a very large and what will be a very important uh, screening trial. We're looking at ways to push out, uh, to use technology to sort of expand the reach of early detection. And we're trying to come up with efficient ways to, uh, 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 to translate very expensive intensive intervention ser services into, into modes that are deliverable at scale in our communities. With respect to uh, primary prevention and discovery of environmental risk factors, um, we have some solid clues, but we really need to uh, scale up our effort there and we need to um, uh, um, make some methodological innovations that are gonna allow us to do that kind of research um, uh, at the scale and with the replicability that we know it's going to uh, need. So with that, I will, I will, I will stop and I'd be delighted to, uh, to take uh, questions. I guess I can stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Craig. That was a really fantastic, really interesting um, talk. I have some questions myself, um, but I also wanna make sure that people have an opportunity to submit questions in the Q&A and we can record them. Um, we can read them out um, if you have any questions. So maybe to give you a minute, if you are thinking of some questions, uh, I wanted to ask if I could, it's kind of a broad question. But given that, and I did realize, by the way, I never introduced myself, but my name is Megan McClellan, and I actually direct the Halley Ford Center for Healthy Children and Families. And this question I have for you uh, is really about the, the center that, that we have at, at OSU and our college is really focused on interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, and we do a lot of team science um, projects. And I'm just wondering, as it relates to the field of autism, how do you think, can you speak, you, you gave some in really good examples. And I thought maybe if you could speak more directly to this question of how you think interdisciplinary collaboration can move the field of autism forward. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well um, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll address it primarily from the perspective of the kind of work that I do where interdisciplinary collaborations have been uh, essential. Um, so, you know, we, we epidemiologists like myself, we rely on our, our colleagues in developmental psychology, not, 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 just to be, not just to be the crank that, that, that generates our outcomes, but to really help us think about the way that we should be uh, um, considering outcomes in our work. So when I talk about methodological advance, advances, I, I, I focus a little bit on the exposure side, the genetic and, 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 and the, uh, the environmental. But we're also very much interested in, 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 in whether or not the classic conception of the autism phenotype, basically the DSM diagnostic uh, uh, um, classifications of the dichotomous outcome set is really the right way to be, thinking, to be looking at etiology. So we're doing a lot of work with, our, with our, our colleagues in developmental psychology looking at the menstrual phenotypes and trying to translate those into our etiologic work. And then, and then there, there, there are other examples where, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that you have these kinds of folks in your center, but, you know, I've, forced, I've been forced to do a lot of collaborative work with um, exposure scientists who, who are, are, are um, uh, essentially are um, analytic chemists who develop these assays for measuring different, different signals for exposure in biologic samples. And it's only been through the collaboration with, 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 with those folks that uh, the tooth assessments that I talked about um, have, have come into being. And we're also doing other works on, on novel exposure assessment, another matrix that we work in. It's a little bit less fun than teeth, but it's meconium, which uh, is, is, is the baby's first bowel movement. And that's also a reservoir into the past because meconium, meconium begins accumulating in about 12 weeks. And there, there, it, there it stays until it passes and we're, we're very interested in, in developing um, biomarkers of exposure in, in, in the county and we've been working collaboratively with, 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 with analytic chemists. So we, we, do a, we do a ton of it in the risk factor work that I do. And, and in, in, the, in some of the early detection work, um, there have been great interdisciplinary cl collaborations with software engineers and computer scientists around uh, computer vision uh, um, analysis for the cell phone based screening. So, I, I think everything that I'm really excited about for doing something different in the field involves a, uh, um, a multidisciplinary collaboration. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, we find the same. We have a, a lot of this sort of sim synergy going on uh, in our center. There's a really great question, somebody, and comment um, by one of our panelists, I mean, one of our uh, audience members. Um, Someone said, thank you. I really appreciated the information about detection and treatment. How can we increase research in detected, detection and treatment? This is from a pharmacist and a mom of an autistic son. Well, um, yeah, how can we, how can we, <laughs> how can we increase? Well, I think we need to increase, I mean, you know, again, I mean, I, 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 I am biased, but I, I do think despite the increases in funding that we've seen, um, given, given the impact and burden of, of, of autism throughout the lifespan, we, we, we need to be doing much more. I do think that um, uh, treatment research is something that I think I think tends to resonate with policymakers. I think that um, the public health science pitch, uh, which is really about getting um, uh, early detection and early treatment in their communities at scale where it can have a real impact resonates. If it's, um, if we're talking about small lab-based efficacy studies, I think it, it, it is less intoxicating for policymakers. So I think the kinds of things that we, we do are, 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 are good examples to bring to policymakers to try to get them engaged because they can, they can see how that's going to really affect the constituency, not just a couple of participants and generate a couple of, a, a couple of papers. So trying to pitch that message is something that we we, 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 we've, we've tried to do with our work. Oh, great, thank you. I have two questions um, from some of our really fantastic graduate students. Um, one from Amada Mahdi is, how accurate is eye tracking technology for the early diagnosis of ASD? Um, yeah, so, so uh, it depends who you ask. Um, and, um, you know, eye tracking is very good at measuring uh, certain aspects of, of, of the phenotype, certain sort of, you know, na narrow uh, assays about certain, uh, you know, certain um, uh, joint attention tasks, for example. When you package it all up and try to see whether or not it, 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 it can um, provide a good signal for, uh, for autism risk, it's a little bit more controversial. So, there have been some studies done at size doing this. There is one, there is a, a, a uh, there is a, another Autism Center of Excellence project. I mentioned that mechanism is funding Diana Robbins' work on her trial with the conventional MCHAT parent report screen. There is, a, there is another a trial going on in Atlanta out of Emory that was trying to use eye tracking into pediatric clinics. Um, it, 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 it's underway, and I haven't seen any preliminary data. We, you know, our, our, our feeling, and I'm dodging the question a little bit today, so I don't, I can't give you a positive and negative predictive value. But I, I, that, that those estimates will be coming from that work. It's a Clint work at Emory. But what we've really been worried about is the um, is the implementation of that. I and mean, even though eye tracking is is becoming more portable and cheaper. To get that into a pediatrician's office and to have them take the time to sit a baby and put up an eye tracker and do that just seems like it, it ain't gonna work in this service environment. So we, we've turned our attention more to the technology-based approaches that, that, that parents can, can, can implement uh, uh, by themselves. But ours is much, ours is, we're far from the point of being able, of doing a randomized trial of, of, of those. Approaches. But so innovative. I mean, I just love that idea. And we focus a lot on um, also on how you um, you create interventions and programs that you can really adapt and scale. And so I think that that's really exciting work. Yeah. Um, OK, um, I have one more um, really great presentation. Given the complex concepts with g and &E, uh, gene environment interactions, can you talk about how you might, how do you work to translate this research to a lay audience? Uh, yeah, it is. It, it is. Uh, it, it is difficult. It is difficult work to translate. Um, um, it, it, it's hard to explain uh, sometimes the importance of gene environment interaction to uh, uh, to non lay audiences. I think really when you talk about uh, G by E findings, what you have to do is you ha you you have to use examples, and this is going to get increasingly complicated uh, if if we start moving from. Um, 
uh, 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 candidate gene studies of you know one genotype against the wild type, which is an easy category, and one exposure. So we have four categories to looking at uh, um, to looking at some kind of polygenic score. You know what does uh, a score of this mean versus a score of that? So you're going to have to try to trans. You're going to have to try to. You're going to have to. It's going to be a challenge. We're going to have to try to figure out ways to make that meaningful. Uh, for a lay audience. And one way that I can think about doing it is by talking about how that score distributes in the population and trying to, 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 to look at ranges, what range of the population falls in this level of risk and sort of converting it to a category and use some of the more conventional ways of talking about, okay, if I have a score in this range and then I have this exposure profile, what's my elevated risk compared to population prevalence? So we are going to have to do things like that. Uh, for translation purposes, and oftentimes in the papers that we write, we don't we don't pay attention to that to that kind of communication. We focus on, you know, the coefficients, and and, and we, the, the person who asked the question is absolutely right. In, in talking to lay audiences, you can't do that. You have to go the next step. Great. Okay, one final question. We're just at time, but um, from colleague uh, our colleague Megan McDonald, who asked, "What are your thoughts on early motor skills?" Um, as um, if on as early indicators in some of the work by Landa's group. Yeah, promising. Yeah, so so Becky Landa is a close friend and collaborator of mine, and, and, and I, you know she she does the test for the, the it's a it's a head lag test where you pull an infant up. Um, I, I I think that that deserves re some replication, some look at in some, in, in some in some larger samples. I will tell you that. Um, it, this is not my work, but, but Jerry Dawson and her group at Duke, who, who, who developed the, the, the cell phone app that we're, that we're integrating in our studies, she has seen some very early uh, uh, interesting findings related to postural sway. So that is a similar kind of thing that's captured on the video. So it's not exactly a replication, but it is you know, it's just, it's about the same age kids that, that Becky looks at with her head lag test and a similar kind of motor issue potentially so I, I think it's a very i think it's a a, a a very a very very promising area uh to, to look at in early detection great thank you um thanks for all these wonderful questions and thanks for a really inspirational and interesting talk i'm really looking forward to hearing more um as in our our small group conversation but i wanted to say thank you to everybody for attending today and um for taking the time on a friday and um, we look forward to hearing more from you soon. Thank you also, Dr. Newschafer, for being here today. My pleasure, thank you all.